Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, or at least afternoon here on the East Coast. Good morning to everyone joining us on the West Coast. This is Lauren Hertel. I'm Communications Manager for the Switzer Foundation. And we're very pleased to welcome all of you today to our webinar with two of our fellows. We'll be talking today about innovation in pre-listing species conservation. Uh, they're looking at specific programs that they're working on in conservation banking for candidate species. Our uh, two fellows are Josh Donlan and Todd Gartner. I'll be introducing them in just a moment. But before I do that, I wanted to give you all just a couple of webinar housekeeping items. Um, first of all, all of your microphones are currently muted. That's in order to prevent any kind of audio feedback during the presentation. But you will have a chance to ask questions using your headset or your telephone uh, after our presenters have finished their presentation. We'll be taking questions via audio from the floor. However, both during and after the presentation, if you have a clarifying question or if you're having trouble with um, the audio or any kind of a technical issue, or if you've got a question for our panelists, please do feel free to use the questions box that's on your GoToWebinar control panel, or alternatively, you can also type a message into the chat window. I'll be following both during the presentation and passing your questions along to our panelists. Uh, in addition to that, the recording, we were recording this webinar today, a recording of the entire webinar, along with the slides that our presenters are presenting from, will be available on our blog either this afternoon or tomorrow morning. That's at switzernetwork.org forward slash blog. I'll repeat that again at the end of our presentation today, at the end of our webinar. But for now, I'd like to welcome all of you to our webinar today, and I'd like to introduce our two fellows that are joining us. First is Josh Donlan. Josh is the director at Advanced Conservation Strategies. He leads the organization by building interdisciplinary teams to tackle problems in novel ways. And this solution that we'll be hearing about today is one of those. Josh trained as a scientist. He holds a PhD from Cornell and a master's from the UC uh, system. He's worked on environmental issues in over a dozen countries, including the management of invasive species, environmental restoration, ecological history, and developing financial and incentive instruments for environmental conservation, so a very broad range of project types. He's been recognized internationally for his contributions and his innovations. He's held fellowships with Fulbright, Guggenheim Foundation, Alcoa, Kinship, of course, the Switzer Foundation, the Environmental Leadership Program, and the Copeland Fellowship in Global Sustainability at Amherst College. He was selected as a finalist in the Marketplace on Innovation Financial, uh, excuse me, Innovative Financial Solutions for development competition that's sponsored by the Gates Foundation, the World Bank and others. Josh was highlighted in the New York Times Magazine article in 2005 of uh, big ideas, their big ideas issue. And he was also named to the list of 25 Saving the Planet by Outside Magazine in 2005. We're very pleased to have Josh with us today. Josh is only one part of our team though today talking with you today. The other half of the team is Todd Gartner, who's a senior associate uh, in conservation incentives and markets with the World Resources Institute, or WRI, as some of you may know it. He uh, has his MF from 2007 from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, and he focuses on market-based mechanisms and sustainable forestry with WRI and, and with his degree. After earning his degree in finance from the University of Maryland at College Park, he worked for almost three years as a corporate financial consultant before transferring his skills to Botswana where he advised the indigenous San people on sustainable business initiatives. So he also has a broad range of working internationally and also a very interesting take on looking at financial incentives and applying them to sustainability problems. So we're very pleased to have both of our fellows here today. I'd like to go ahead and hand off to Todd first, who will be doing our presentation. And just a reminder for all of you who are just joining us, if you have any questions during Todd and Josh's presentations, you can use the questions box or the chat window and then after their presentations, you'll have a chance to use your computer headset or telephone to ask an audio question. Josh, Todd, welcome. Thank you, Lauren. Appreciate the warm introductions. And I hope everyone is doing fantastic wherever you might be. So right now you're hearing Todd Gartner, and I'm in Portland, Oregon. And as Lauren mentioned, I work for the World Resources Institute. For those that aren't familiar, WRI is an international think tank based in Washington, D.C. And we work all over the globe. So climate and energy issues in China, sustainable transportation initiatives in Mexico City, governance issues in India. And what I'm going to be talking about today is some of our work on habitat and species conservation in the United States. So before we get into it, I just wanted to allow Josh a minute just to more thoroughly introduce advanced conservation strategies. 
Sure, next time. Uh, the Dance Conservation Strategies is basically a small NGO um, that works with other governments, uh, multilateral organizations like the United Nations Environment Program and other NGOs to design and implement um, incentive programs. We're largely focused on incentive programs around the world. Most of our work is outside the United States, but we have a number of projects in the U.S., uh, including the one we're talking about today. And um, I'll stop there. More information on, on our group can be found at, at our, our website, advancedconservation.org. Great. And it's always tough on webinars to really understand who your audience is and what their perspectives might be. But based on the registration, um, it's a pretty diverse group, both geographically and in terms of the type of organizations that folks work for. There's folks that are with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, state wildlife agencies, nonprofit groups, uh, the private sector, especially private mitigation banking, uh, some of our friends in, in the various fellowship networks, especially the Switzer Network, um, and, and other folks with Department of Defense and others as well. So we appreciate everyone um, tuning in today. What we're going to do, and there's a pretty diverse range of familiarity with these concepts and ideas, so we just want to spend just a couple of minutes making sure everyone's on the same page when we refer to a market-based approach. But we'll quickly dive into the meat of the presentation and the initiative that Josh and I have been working on together for the better part of three and a half years. We're really talking about the benefits of a pre-listing conservation approach, the elements you need in terms of supply, demand, and infrastructure, um, kind of where we were, where we are, and where we're going, and then open it up for question and answer. So we think it'll be about 25 minutes presentation and then 25 to 30 minute question and answer. So with that, I'll kind of move forward. When many people think about the forests of the U.S., they have visions of Yellowstone and Yosemite. And that's not totally unfair, but when you think about all the benefits that come off the of forest lands, and this is clean water, clean air, recreational opportunities, habitat for wildlife, it's important to remember how the forest land is actually divvied up in terms of ownership. And nearly two-thirds of all forest land in the U.S. is held by private forest land owners. And nearly half of that is held by what we often call family forest owners or non-industrial landowners. And increasingly, these landowners are up against a number of challenges. And because of those challenges, we're seeing an increased level of degradation and land use change. So what Josh and I are focused on is understanding what the drivers of that change are and what sort of incentives, both financially, from a technical assistance perspective, and other sorts of incentives can be put in place to make sure these lands stay in private ownership and are well managed for future generations. And for me, it really boils down to my conservation hero, Aldo Leopold. And after reading the Sound San County Almanac, is really kind of where I started thinking about the intersection of, of economy and environment. And Leopold, well over a generation ago, recognized that conservation boils down to rewarding and recognizing the positive things that landowners provide to society. And if you look present day, Secretary Vilsack at Department of Agriculture, he says the exact same thing. He uses a few more buzzwords, emerging markets, conservation incentives, but in the end it's the same. We need to understand and recognize the services and benefits that come off of private forest lands and figure out a way to reward those stewardships that we as a society benefit on uh, to, to survive. So taking that from a general idea and putting it into action, you know, is the idea of this payment for environmental services um, theory. And it's, it's looking at what services and values are coming off the land, and if we don't properly value them, they will become degraded. So there's a lot of effort, both in the private sector, nonprofit, and academic world, understanding how you do that, how you take that from an ivory tower concept to on the ground, create a monetary value or an asset class around these environmental services. Once you have that, you have the framework to buy, sell, value, and trade, and factor into the decision-making process, not so different from a traditional financial market. In order for that to happen, there's three things that you need. And some people are lumpers, some are splitters. I tend to kind of group things together. And you need three things, demand, supply, and transactional infrastructure. And the supply and infrastructure are really important but if you can't figure out where the demand is going to come from, you're not going to have a robust payment for environmental system approach. 
And we'll talk about these a bit more as we run through it, but in the end, there needs to be a reason or a rationale for folks to invest in conservation on private land. Sometimes that's the Endangered Species Act, the Clean Water Act, regulations or policies. Other times it's risk reduction, and it makes good bottom line business sense to do it. You have to understand on the supply side where these services and benefits are going to come from and what incentives it's going to take for landowners to engage. And then you need all the stuff in between that connects the buyer and seller for the enhancement of the services. We need to understand the risks that are involved. If you're paying for 100 acres of conservation and it burns down, how have you accounted for that inherent risk of ecology? And how do we get the information off the conference circuit and onto the ground? So when you think about on the ground, this is an actual property in Oregon that we've been working on for a while, thinking about the multitude of revenue streams that can complement the traditional asset class, which is uh, sustainable forestry and agriculture. This property, that revenue stream alone was not enough to make it financially viable. So they started looking at what other opportunities were out on the landscape, and they began to participate in some cost share programs through the NRCS Farm Bill. And that was really interesting. It started to get them a little bit further along towards that balance of ecology and uh, economic sustainability. They then looked at their options for conservation easements. Could they sell or donate their development rights and get major tax benefits or revenue streams because of that? Were there recreational leases with fishing and hunting that could provide additional income streams and provided the incentive to really enhance their riparian areas and improve their fisheries? And then they started looking at what we call emerging markets, wetland restoration, species and habitat recovery, and carbon sequestration. No one landowner is most likely going to be able to engage in all of these things, but it's increasingly important for landowners and managers to understand the opportunities that are on the landscape, what the potential revenue streams are, and what the potential trade-offs might be, longer forest rotations, public access, etc., and do those mesh with their conservation goals. This is especially important if by chance you're adjacent to a military installation. We're going to be focusing primarily on habitat and species programs today and in the candidate conservation framework, which Josh will talk about in a moment. And when we talk about this as an emerging market opportunity, um, it's a little bit of a misnomer. Um, these numbers are a little bit old. I think they're from 2009. They're from the Ecosystem Marketplace Species Banking website. Um, but in the end, you start to see that this stuff is real. It's happening in a variety of geographies, both domestically and abroad, and there's real dollars behind it. So we can continue to understand how we connect the demand, the supply, and get all the infrastructure right, we can really start to align ecology, environment, and social values. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Josh to talk a little bit more about the benefits of tree listing and start moving into the specifics of our project. Great. And maybe we should stop here to see if there are any audio presentation problems or clarifying questions. So far, everything looks great, sounds great, and we don't have any questions so far. Okay, great. So next slide. So as Todd mentioned, we've been working on this issue of what we're calling pre-listing conservation uh, going on about three years. And we've been working heavily with a suite of partners, American Forest Foundation, Longleaf Alliance, Defenders of Wildlife, Environmental Defense Fund, Willamette Partnership, and others. And, the, and our, our main goal is to try to develop a framework, let's call it a marketplace perhaps, where we can <clears throat> incentivize species conservation upstream of regulation, that is upstream of the Endangered Species Act. And we have been focused on candidate species. <clears throat> For those of you that are not familiar with candidate species, candidate species are species that have been determined to meet threatened and endangered status, but have been precluded to be listed, formally listed under the Endangered Species Act for a number of reasons. So these are species that are on their way and one step away, if you will, from being protected under the Endangered Species Act. And there are a number of agencies, both federal and non-federal agencies, that hold environmental risk, if you will, around those species. The Department of Defense, for example, has Bases are consolidated in the United States as troops come home from, from Iraq. Certain bases, like Fort Benning in the southeast, 
hold environmental risk around the Gopher Tortoise because Fort, ben Fort Benning tends to do a lot of tank training and that often runs in conflict with the Gopher Tortoise. And if the Gopher Tortoise was to become listed under Endangered Species Act, that would bring on, trigger a number of regulatory requirements for uh, the Department of Defense that might potentially temporarily shut down training operations. And obviously, uh, an important goal, the main goal of many of the of the Department of Defense installations. In a similar fashion, oil and gas holds certain oil and gas development holds a certain amount of risk around the sage grouse in the western U.S. In the Midwest, wind energy companies have invested to the tune of 10, 14 billion dollars in wind energy are starting to install installations where the, that overlaps with the sage grouse, which also is a Canada species. So we've been focused on can we develop a framework that incentivizes project developers to <clears throat> act early and do proactive conservation that will result in net conservation benefits upstream of regulation and potentially could they finance those conservation actions uh, on private lands, thus incentivizing landowners to create and sell conservation outcomes, i.e. credits, uh, through changes in land management practices. Um, next slide. So maybe a good place to start is uh, what are the benefits to thinking about designing and implementing a pre-listing conservation program. Now, these are at least five of them. One, obviously acting upstream of regulation and incentivizing early action should, in almost all cases, reduce the cost and the challenges around species recovery. And also, it's important for what people tend to call conservation-reliant species. And that's important because this system could potentially incentivize habitat management which is critical for, particularly critical for conservation reliant species, but it's currently not required for non-federal landowners under the Endangered Species Act. It also tends to shift uh, a mitigation system or a conservation system toward outcomes because we're talking about incentivizing positive conservation measures prior to impacts, and thus those outcomes can be evaluated and 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 um, and evaluated with respect to these future impacts. In a best case scenario, a pre-listing conservation program could reduce or even preclude the need to list these Canada species or even these at-risk species, if you will. And <clears throat> lastly, if we're able to connect incentives for project developers to act early and mitigate their environmental risk uh, around Canada species by financing conservation action on private lands, then we're in a situation where we can actually mobilize new resources for conservation on private lands through some type of incentive program. Next slide, Todd. So we've been focused on uh, kind of two parallel efforts. <clears throat> One, designing and thinking about this pre-listing conservation program at a national level, thinking about how this can be integrated into policy, how will this scale up, or what are the different models for, for, for potentially scaling up uh, a pre-listing pre conservation program. And then in parallel, we've been focused on a, a place-based site-specific site, uh, sort of a pre-pilot project, if you will, and that is in the southeast United States, in Georgia, where we're focused on the candidate species gopher tortoise, working with our partners, American Forest Foundation and Long Lake Alliance. So, th so the situation here is we're talking about Fort Benning uh, that's increasing, receiving more troops, uh, increasing their training, and potentially or do hold environmental risk around the, the gopher tortoise, which is currently a candidate species. <laughs> and that we see that as the main demand driver is the Department of Defense incentivized to, if the opportunity existed, to mitigate that environmental risk by engaging in a pre-listing conservation program around the gopher tortoise. The supply side comes from the private landowners in and around the vicinity of Fort Benning that happen to often own and manage longleaf pine forests, and there's a whole suite 
of latent conservation potential, if you will, if we can incentivize those private landowners to actively manage and improve their private uh, forests for gopher tortoise. So we're briefly going to talk about supply, demand, and infrastructure with respect to um, this long lead forest um, system in the southeast United States. Next slide, Todd. So this project started over three years ago with a CIG grant from American Forest Foundation and uh, World Resource Institute and has been early on uh, a very intensive stakeholder engagement program. And early on an advisory committee was set up from across that included multiple agencies including federal and federal agencies as well as university scientists as well as NGOs, et cetera. So there's been a lot of input from a variety of stakeholders and the program has gone through a number of reiterations, evolution, uh, improvements over the three years and um, we'll talk a little bit about those as we go through, go through the project. Um, next slide. So to talk a little bit about the science, if we're talking about trying to to uh, develop a marketplace where there might be transactions through some advanced mitigation program in a pre-listing scenario, we have to be able to commoditize some conservation outcomes. And we've spent quite a bit of time thinking about how can we turn gopher tortoise conservation, if you will, into some, some type of credit that can be bought and sold. Initially, we were very focused on trying to create a, cre a credit around, strictly around habitat because we all know at the end of the day what we're really interested in is the management and the restoration of gopher tortoise habitat over the long term. And we, working with a number of gopher tortoise um, ecologists and others, developed a metric that included a number of ecological community attributes as well as a number of landscape attributes to be able to go onto a private um, a private parcel and evaluate the the quality of the habitat for gopher tortoise. <clears throat> While working through the program it became very apparent uh, that that we also needed a population uh, input from a population demographic standpoint. This is important, obviously, for the viability of gopher tortoises, but it's also important from a policy perspective because the Endangered Species Act is species-centric, and there's no way to get around that. And so there's important reasons to include population measures, demographic measures, uh, and incorporate them into the creation of these gopher tortoise habitat credits or species credits. So I won't go into the details, but to give you a brief a summary of where we're at um, in terms of the crediting and debiting of this potential system, um, each parcel, whether it's going to uh, come from the supply side and produce net conservation benefits for the tortoise, or if it's a site that might uh, be impacted in the future um, with respect to gopher tortoises, we developed a, a science-driven credit methodology that, that takes into account ecological attributes, landscape context, and actual demographic estimates <coughs> um, of gopher tortoises and commoditizes that uh, and, and weights uh, the acres into a credit score. So next slide, Todd. And, and moving into the supply, so if I'm, a, if I'm a landowner in the southeast United States and I own, own 500 acres of longleaf forest and, and are potentially interested in participating in such a program, um, that is receiving payments, financial payments to manage my land in a way that will maintain and improve gopher tortoises on my land, how I'm, uh, what are the eligibility requirements? So we've come up with a number of eligibility requirements for the landowners in order to participate. And this is a list, a partial list of some of those requirements. Obviously, you have to be located in the priority location. That is, 
be within the, the zone in which we think the, the impacts are happening. At the moment, a conservation easement is a, is a requirement to be able to participate, which um, uh, uh, mitigates for certain risks in terms of the long term, the long term contracts, if you will, of the program. You have to have a number. Of, you have to have a certified management plan consistent with program requirements in place. You have to have an endowment, and we'll talk a little bit about that um, later in the talk. But there has to be um, the financial infrastructure in place to cover the long-term management costs for gopher tortoise uh, um, habitat. In this case, we're talking mainly about management activities such as prescribed burning, um, control of non-native plants and some type of monitoring program. So those, those management activities have to be, um, the financial resources have to be in place to conduct those management activities in perpetuity. And we also have a, a, a minimum acre requirement in order to be eligible. Next slide, Todd. A bit of a side note, as we started to think about designing this incentive program or designing this potential incentive program, we were able to team up with a social psychologist at Virginia Tech by the name of Mike Cerise. And instead of going in thinking we knew what the landowners wanted, we knew their perceptions, we knew their incentive structure, et cetera, we actually were able to conduct a landowner survey. Uh, and briefly, using a technique called choice set modeling, we were able to look at the main components of a hypothetical incentive uh, program, conservation easement, no easement, purchase easement, donated easement, for example, contract length, everything from perpetuity to 10 years, profit margin, payment structure, how are the profit payments made, uh, administration level, how much responsibility, decision-making power does the actual landowner have compared to the people pro uh, um, running the program or the government for that matter? What is your obligation, uh, particularly at the termination of the program? Are you, do you, are, can you return to baseline conditions? Are there no obligation, their full obligation? And what are the species benefits in terms of the actual conservation outcomes? Using this landowner survey, we were able to collect real data from real landowners, the landowners that we were targeting, and get a sense and actually uh, predict with data as we tweak these, these different components of the incentive program, what is the probability of the average landowner opting in or opting out into this voluntary program? I think it's very important to remember that these are voluntary programs. And in order for them, in order for conservation measures to scale up, we need a large percentage of, of, of program participants opting in. So I won't go into the details of that other than that this was an extremely useful uh, technique early on in the design of an incentive program and it's transferable to almost any incentive program, both in the U.S. And, and outside the U.S. in terms of thinking about how can we maximize participation of incentive programs with data. Next slide, Todd. So in terms of demand, as Todd mentioned, demand, at least in my view, is, is the, the real bottleneck in terms of these voluntary incentive programs. Uh, both in the U.S. and outside the U.S. for that matter. We tried to approach um, our thinking in terms of trying to be open to having multiple demand drivers. On the left, we're very focused at the moment on can we create the policy space, if you will, to create pre-compliance demand. Because we see that as a major driver in many cases in the United States. That is, the Department of Defense, wind energy company, solar company, oil and gas company, et cetera, they know they're holding environmental risk around certain candidate species. And if those species are listed, it's going gonna, it's gonna to trigger um, quite, a, quite a bit of regulatory requirements, quite a bit of lost time, quite a bit of um, money, et cetera, dealing with those regulatory triggers. So can we create a system where those project developers, either federal or non-federal, can mitigate that risk by <clears throat> doing conservation measures up front? And, and can, can those conservation measures count 
downstream of regulation. From our work, we, the, the, that regulatory predictability, which would come from either the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or NOAA, whether we're talking about terrestrial species or, or marine species, is probably a key driver with demand. Um, at the same time, we're also thinking about trying to design these frameworks or these markets, if you will, where these credits could also be sold on a voluntary basis whether that's uh, some CSR program, where, whether that's strategic philanthropy in terms of moving toward outcome-based investment, or, is, or if that's just uh, a strict business case in terms of it's good business to mitigate your environmental uh, risk up front. Next slide, Todd. And just a quick note in terms of, of, of thinking about <clears throat> layering the system on, on top of uh, current strategies in the United States for conservation, which often comes down to conservation easements, um, that's been our, our current approach, at least in the southeast, in the sense that easements are well developed. There's lots of easements already in place, thanks to the work of a number of NGOs around the Fort Benning area. And Easements focus on more or less what a landowner can't do. I can't build a strip mall on my land. I can't develop a certain portion of my land, et cetera. We're hoping to layer on a, a positive incentive, if you will, in terms of we can create additional biodiversity co-benefits on top of that easement by incentivizing proactive action by the landowners on top of the easement. and and. Uh, and then the landowner receives financial incentives for those proactive uh, conservation actions. Next slide, Todd. Josh, could I just break in for a moment? This is Lauren. We had a question from several slides back, and I think this might be a good moment to uh, answer it. Is that okay? Sure. Okay, sure. the question was from Deborah Spaulding, and she was asking, and it's related to your previous slide, but I think it's a slightly different question. She was asking, how do you forecast demand for these credits in the absence of a compliance market when participation is voluntary? So a slightly different question from what you were talking about. How do you forecast the demand right. for credits? That's a wonderful question, and and we have, and early on, we, we've been focused on how do we create the, the, the science-driven credit and debiting how do we engage landowners? How do we map uh, the incentives around landowners to opt in? And now we 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 switched over to focus on demand and forecasting demand is a huge challenge at the moment because of lots and lots of uncertainty. There's particularly there's uncertainty around the idea of regulatory predictability. If and how can the can uh, the service and NOAA um, provide that regulatory predictability? which we think is a key driver in demand with respect to the, the regulatory driver around pre-listing conservation. Uh, a, a first step would be to, um, and in fact the DOD is doing this, uh, and probably others are doing this in the private sector, is to scope the 250 plus um, conservation uh, candidate species on the current candidate list and then l overlay that with um, project development activities and that at least would give you an idea of the risk profile that if a pre-listing conservation program is set in place after a number of pilot projects that would be give you an idea where the potential demand would come from. Josh if I could just add to that um, Josh and I wrote a paper last year kind of highlighting um, this project and and from talking to folks, what we came to realize is an anchor buyer is, is a necessity to get to scale. So whether it's Department of Defense in the Southeast, wind or solar developers, Department of Transportation, uh, at least in the near term, they're the ones that are really going to carry the weight of proactive investment. Um, and we found that um, it needs to be an entity that expects to have a fairly large impact over the foreseeable future and we classify the foreseeable future as at least over the next five years. There was a, a, a court settlement, um, a nonprofit group sued the Fish and Wildlife Service last year saying you cannot continue to put these species on the candidate list, which in some ways is almost like a, a wait list or holding list. Mm 
that you have to make a determination, either thumbs up or thumbs down, by sometime in 2016 on over 250 species. So there's, you know, if you think about entities like wind, solar, DOD, DOT, they've begun mapping, you know, at least out for the next five years, if not beyond, have a pretty good idea of where that infrastructure development might take place, to what scale or what degree, and have a pretty good idea of what that environmental risk might look like. And for many of these folks, it's really scary. And if you look at the, um, you know, some of the solar development in, in New Mexico and other places, uh, they've been burned by not fully accounting for and being proactive on that environmental risk and are now sitting on invested dollars not able to move forward. Um, so it's, it's, it's not going to be sort of a piecemeal approach. It's really going to be anchor buyers. But what the voluntary piece, um, which complements the regulatory piece, is we, we think it should be agnostic to where that investment is coming from whether it's farm bill dollars, as Josh was saying, uh, strategic philanthropy, the system is set up to direct those dollars all through the same system, and we can begin to aggregate up into something bigger at the landscape level. For many species right now, um, and I think a lot of people might agree with this in the southeast, there's a lot of really good isolated incidences of conservation going on but we're not able at this point to sort of add it up to understand how it's aggregating into something bigger. And we think this is one of those ways to do that. Uh, Josh and Todd, we did just have one other follow-up question while you're here, and it's a quick one, I think, but it's from David Takish, and he's wondering, do these credits come with a no surprises guarantee if the uh, credit species becomes formally listed under the ESA? It's, it, it's a, Josh, you, should I take this and you can fill in? Is that okay? Sure, sure. So um, the no surprises is a really good question and something that we've, we've thought a lot about and had a lot of conversations with Fish and Wildlife Service and the state wildlife agencies. And I think the big kind of split is are you a federal entity or a non-federal entity? If you're a non-federal entity, I think you can get a pretty high level of what we're now calling regulatory predictability. We started with the word assurance. We then moved to the word certainty, and now we're using predictability. And there is some rationale behind sort of the verbiage. Uh, but not, there's a lot more certainty that can be provided to a non-federal solar or wind developer than a Department of Defense and Department of Transportation because they have a much higher obligation um, than, than a non-federal actor. Um, it really comes down to dialogue and engagement between the potential buyers and the regulators to understand what that certainty or predictability might look like um, and how that factors into their risk reduction needs. Uh, a lot of this comes down to return on investment. And taking Department of Defense as an example here, they've spent hundreds of millions of dollars over the last couple of decades on easements and acquisitions of lands that are adjacent to their installations. And that has served them well in terms of um, buffers for smoke and noise, and clearly it's better to have working forest lands than it is housing developments when you're doing night training operations. And there's sort of a qualitative benefit from a, a regulatory species sense, but they really can't go to their superiors at this point and say, here's what our $100 million got us in terms of regulatory predictability. This system, though it's not going to give 100% no surprises, it really levels the playing field and gives a much more quantitative understanding of what they've done, what they've gotten for that, and what that might mean as they have future impacts. All of this is based on adaptive management, and as the science improves, um, we can adjust the mitigation ratios and other sorts of risk factors to account for the inherent uncertainty. And we have a, we have a policy slide that speaks a little bit to that in a few seconds. Um, okay, so next slide. And this slide speaks uh, a little bit to your question, Deborah, in terms of how do you deal with, with unknown demand. So we spent quite a bit of time um, thinking about and actually working with a number of MBAs to try to create a market model, if you will, um, that would potentially be scalable. And we, we've kind of focused in on a broker model. You know, the advantage of thinking about a broker is that you can a broker at least potentially can provide the, the interim demand or the initial demand and the liquidity 
to start an incentive program around pre-listing conservation. And then, and then once demand is generated or scaled up, then can, can resell those credits to either primary buyers or the other potential buyers that we, that we spoke of. So this is a, a simplified schematic that, that looks at kind of the, the uh, potential market model where you have uh, sellers, whether they're private, non-industrial um, landowners, conservation NGOs, or even private industrial timber organizations, for example. And then in the middle, the middleman is you have some broker. That could, that could be an NGO. That could actually be a for-profit company in theory, et cetera. And the broker, the main purpose, purpose of the broker is a number of um, um, roles. One, they lower the risk for the sellers to enter into the program, and they provide demand. And they also manage the risk around a potential default or in these credits by perhaps doing a credit insurance pool, as we see more and more common in the carbon markets. They're responsible for the verification and monitoring. They're responsible for dealing with any legalities and breach of contract. And they're able to management <coughs> manage the large insurance fund or stewardship fund that would pay out to the private landowners and to the sellers. And then on the right side, you have uh, the buyers. And in this case, we're mainly focused on federal and non-federal project developers that are buying credits and hold those credits for future regulatory requirements if and when it's needed if the target species becomes listed. And then we have a number of other potential buyers that we mentioned e easier. Uh, mentioned before, and then regulating and providing this regulatory predictability, which is uh, we think is a major driver for these primary buyers and providing oversight is, is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, and then the necessary bridge financing could come from um, avenues such as impact investing firms, perhaps program-related investments from foundations, or initially perhaps um, more traditional philanthropy. <clears throat> Next slide. I think I'm going to turn it over to you, Todd, to talk about uh, more of the trans transactional infrastructure. Sure. And and you know, just building off the last slide, um, there's a gentleman named David Primovich who works with the Freshwater Trust, and they focus a lot on water quality trading, especially in the Pacific Northwest. And he framed it really well. One of the big barriers right now is transaction costs. Um, and what we need to do is simplify the system to the point where a landowner can be looking at his balance sheet and say, right now I manage for timber or I manage for potatoes, and add conservation credits to that list of choices. And it should be just as easy for him to understand that balance of diversification. If I'm going to grow a third of my property in timber, a third in potatoes, and a third in conservation credits. And that's really what we're focusing on doing. And as part of that, We've done a lot of work with our friends at the Willamette Partnership to understand how you ensure that this stuff is real. Even if it's based on best science, even if you've accounted for risk, there's still a lot of moving parts. And they've done a great job of streamlining things and making sure there's consistency. And that then leads to a greater level of confidence that what you're measuring, monitoring, selling, and verifying is real. And it starts with uh, the eligibility piece. So they have a whole sort of checklist system to ensure that those that are engaging from the seller side are legitimately eligible, in the right place, have the right acreage, uh, and, and you know, can provide the services and benefits that we're actually paying for. There's a, a simple or relatively simple calculation piece. There's a whole bunch of stuff sort of in the um, behind the scenes that through stakeholder engagement builds off the credit calculation piece, which Josh mentioned on the acres and species abundance. And then there, of course, is the verification piece, and this is probably the most important. Early on, it's based on modeling. It's based on some assumptions. There needs to be boots on the ground, the use of GIS with satellite imagery to actually go out there and say, you're saying that you created, you know, 120 additional acres of gopher tortoise habitat. Is that real? So figuring out how you actually verify that this stuff is real and those benefits are tangible. Uh, and then the register and tracking thing. So this really um, focuses on ensuring that there's no double dipping, that things aren't sold twice, that we're able to have a very structured and systematic monitoring regime in place both in the short and the long run and seeing what we're getting at scale. And each of these things generally has a third party component to it. So those that develop the modeling for credit calculation 
aren't the ones that are going out and doing the monitoring and verification. Um, there's a third party system, you see the slide on the right, uh, Market Environmental Registry, where each conservation credit has its own serial number and is posted on a registry, so at any time someone can go and click on that and see where the conservation credit was generated, some of the documentation behind it, the monitoring reports, and there's a greater level of, of confidence that this stuff is real, which we only think will give both the regulators more comfort in these approaches, but also spur additional investments. Um, you know, as Josh mentioned, we've been working on this for, for, for quite some time, and um, there's been a lot of obstacles and learning experiences along the way, and a lot of really positive outcomes. And these are some of the, the key challenges uh, that we've been trying to work through, and it helped sort of um, get other private projects off the ground based on our experiences. And as Josh highlighted, initially we had a very habitat-centric approach, and that was not because Josh and I like habitat better than species, it's because that's what the stakeholders on the ground, the ecologists, the herbatologists, the foresters, the landowners, said was most important. Um, in the end, the ESA was written as a species-centric regulatory document. So how do you create a system that really addresses the threat, habitat fragmentation, loss, lack of management, with the regulatory structure of a, a species or population document? So we've been working quite a bit with our colleagues and with the Fish and Wildlife Service to understand how you ensure this stuff will hold up in court from an ESA perspective while being as holistic as possible, possible and taking a multi-species ecosystem approach. The interagency coordination is huge. Um, if you just deal with the Fish and Wildlife Service, sometimes it's difficult to navigate the federal level versus the region versus the state versus the local. And then when you begin to bring in state wildlife agencies, Army Corps of Engineers, USDA, um, and other groups, it, it's difficult for many folks to navigate that, especially if you're a landowner. Oftentimes you hear them saying, it's just not worth my time, there's too much paperwork, there's not enough coordination, I have to knock on too many doors. So a lot of the focus on how we streamline the process, create a more programmatic approach instead of one-off individual by individual uh, occurrences. The proactive spending, and Deborah, this gets to your question, where is the demand? And many organizations, and especially federal agencies, have a difficult time on their balance sheets spending money to reduce future risk. Part of that is because they have so many risks right in front of them that they have to deal with yesterday. How do they justify um, spending to prevent something in the future? Uh, we personally believe that that is changing, um, and hopefully it won't take uh, all these species becoming listed before we actually get moving. The pilot versus policy is a little bit of chicken and egg thing. Uh, folks at the local level that we've, that we've dealt with have said we really need some guidance and some cover that this type of approach is okay, that we can give this regulatory certainty, um, that we can offer some form or fashion of the no surprises, and we, we, it might be good if we had some guidance from, from the national office. The national office sometimes has said, well, we'd really like to see more pilot development to see how the mechanics actually play out in practice before we give guidance. So as Josh mentioned, we've been focusing on parallel streams to understand how one interacts with the other. And then the last, which is probably most important, is the idea of precision versus practicality. We've done our best, um, and neither Josh or I live in the southeast or are gopher tortoise or longleaf experts. Um, so we've relied upon, uh, you know, the experts themselves. You know, those who can help us figure out what is the best science and how do you create a program that ensures the net conservation benefit. Sometimes we've run into barriers where there is some uncertainty, and we've, said, and we've been told you need a higher level of that science. And our thought is, well, this species is going to be listed if we don't do something now. So can we look at mitigation ratios, adaptive management, and all be on board that we have a pretty good idea of the ecology and the management that's needed and begin to move forward? There is a risk of developing the perfect program that has such a high transaction cost and such a barrier for entry that no one actually uses it. So it's a fine balance between the precision and the practicality. So we're going to go to questions. I want to briefly take one minute to go over and talk a little bit about policy, um, and then we'll go right to questions because we're running a little bit, uh, a little short on time. But 
Just briefly, we've been working with a number of organizations, in particular Defenders of Wildlife, to try to identify a policy roadmap with existing ESA tools, which I think is an important point, um, that could facilitate pre-listing pre conservation. And we've, we've um, uh, identified three main policy tools. And, whether, and depending on which policy tool is driven by two main characteristics. One, whether you're a federal or non-federal agencies with respect to project developer. And two, <clears throat> how much detail does the project developer know about potential future impacts? And this is a basically a flow chart that, that identifies potential existing policy instruments that could facilitate a pre-listing conservation program or pre-listing conservation agreement under existing uh, ESA tools. For example, if you are, if there's a lot of uncertainty around the potential future impacts, then we're probably thinking about something adopting, uh, adopting current conservation baking guidance and related crediting systems in a pre-listing context. If we know a lot about the, um, the details around future impacts, uh, whether you're a federal or non-federal agency, we're talking about a potential conference process, that is a conference opinion um, that's drafted with a uh, draft incidental take statement that, this, that then can roll over into a biological opinion if and when the species is listed. If we're talking about a non-federal agency uh, and are in the realm of Section 10 of the SA, there's, there's already great policy that is Conservation Canada Agreement with assurances that can issue a what's called a Section 10 Enhancement Survival Permit, permit um, that could provide assurances uh, in a pre-listing conservation context. So that's just a, I, I know that's a very rapid policy roadmap, but um, I, in the interest of time, I think we'll, we'll go right to questions. Sure. As Josh mentioned, I mean, a couple of years ago, this, this was not a concept on radar. Um, now it is. There was a recent call for advanced notice proposed rulemaking. The Fish and Wildlife Service is taking it seriously. We're working with some of our friends at, at PERC and the Marine Institute, kind of highlighting this idea. It's just accepted as a, a 12 big ideas for 2012. Uh, we're coming out with an edited volume with our partners, as you see up in the right-hand corner, kind of characterizing all the stuff that's going on and pulling it together. And then what we need to do is figure out what guidance looks like and get more pilots on the ground to test this idea. So. Um, you know, lots of funders, lots of friends who have made this possible, and uh, we'll, we'll open it up for questions at this point. Perfect. Thank you so much, both Josh and Todd. We have um, one question so far from, uh, this is a follow-up from David Takash, or maybe it's a, it's a separate question. David, I'm going to go ahead and unmute your mic, and you can ask your question. Yeah, I don't know if you can hear me. Um, one of the things that is uncontroversial about what you're doing is that these are for candidate conservation species, that is to say you're facilitating conservation efforts that otherwise wouldn't happen. Uh, it gets much more controversial when you have already listed species and you have things like habitat conservation plans or conservation banking that allow uh, landowners to perhaps evade uh, responsibilities under the ESA that they'd otherwise have. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts for how much this extends to species after they've been listed? Or do you see this approach as being really uh, uh, value-added benefits for candidate or non-listed species that you're getting conservation efforts that you otherwise would not get? Correct. We're viewing this as the, as the latter. Can we, can we develop a program that incentivizes early conservation for candidate species or at-risk species upstream of regulation that will, at the minimum, provide early uplift for species recovery if the species is listed and at a maximum would actually preclude the need to list. Now obviously the latter situation is probably uh, relatively rare, but nonetheless the idea is can we start this road to species recovery um, upstream of the ESA triggering regulatory requirements. And do you have any thoughts on the applic applicability to post-listing, or do you just not go there, that's not what this is about, that's for somebody else to deal with? Right now, that's, that, that's not where, we're, where we've been focused. Yeah, um, we're, at the we're, same we're time. Trying to take the tools, we're trying to take the existing tools that are operating downstream of BSA and adopt them upstream of BSA. Okay. 
Okay, so let me go ahead and open it up to any other questions. You can feel free to use the uh, questions box, the chat window, or just use the raise hand button and we will call on you live. It was a thorough presentation. We do not have questions flooding in, um, which is good. That means you covered a lot. Anyone uh, with questions for Josh or Todd? Well, Josh and Todd, we don't have any questions coming in. Was there anything else that you wanted to cover that you wanted to make sure if you had time that you could get to it? Nothing specific on my end. Now, I know that you are no, looking let's... for some feedback. Um, oh, we've got a question. Hang on one second. This is um, from Mary, and I hope I pronounced your last name right. Sinekas? Sinekas? I don't know if that's pronounced correctly, but she's asking what are the next steps for your project? So the, the next is a great question. The next steps are, there, there's several. Um, the advance notice for proposed rulemaking commenting period just ended uh, a week or two ago. And we worked in coordination with Defenders of Wildlife, the Environmental Defense Fund, American Forest Foundation, and Willamette Partnership um, to really give detailed comments uh, to the Fish and Wildlife Service on how they can continue to uh, help pilots develop and potentially help create guidance and all the elements that are necessary to make that happen. So part of it is a little bit of wait and see now, how the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service responds to the, the comments that were submitted. Uh, we're also working on the ground continually with the Gopher Tortoise Work, continuing to engage with Department of Defense um, and the state agencies uh, on, on, on how we continue to move this forward and actually get some, some initial transactions to really test out the mechanism. Similarly, in the, in the western states, the sage grouse and, and Midwest Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, with lesser prairie chicken, pilots are developing there. So it's really putting this couple of years of development into action and figuring out what's working and what's the application. Yeah, I'd say the, the, next, the, next great, the, the great next steps would be a suite of pilot projects um, supported by, by the Fish and Wildlife Service where We'll, we'll, we're bound to learn lots by trying to implement um, a number of isolated pilot projects around Canada species. And, and the timing is actually somewhat helpful here. Because of the lawsuit last year in the settlement, you have over 250 species that if nothing is done, if there's no change in trajectory, they're going to be listed by 2016. So there needs to be innovative solutions and attempts at trying new, new, new ways of, of, of doing things um, to hopefully preclude that from happening. So we do think that the service has uh, the incentive to act. We feel that there's a number of potential buyers who have the incentive to act. And we feel that from the lenders we've spoken with, many of them really want to do the right thing. And if you can add on a financial incentive, are very willing to engage. Super. We have, we have, hopefully, hopefully this is a little louder. I louder. suggested my headset. Um, we have a follow-up question from Dave Kramer. Kramer. He says he apologizes if you already covered this, but I don't think that you did. Uh, he says, but he's just wondering if there are any analogous policies or practices outside of the U.S. U.S. FWS does a lot with migratory birds, for example. He says he sees that Josh has done and is doing cool stuff in the space in Latin America, but he wasn't sure about the relevance to the species per se. Sure. I, uh, the, we have a, I have a little bit about audio, but I think um, I heard the question. Can you guys hear me all right? We can. We can. Okay. So uh, with, with respect to analogies outside the U.S., um, the, the, the pre-listing conservation framework is, I, in my view, particularly relevant to um, situations outside the U.S. because it's it's somewhat placed in between a, a strong regulatory driver framework and uh, a, a, um, a framework where there's no regulation at all. We know that in many countries outside the U.S. we're trying to do conservation programs where there are very weak or no regulatory drivers. And there are a number of similar projects that I'm involved in where um, we're piloting a, a very similar framework. For example, in Mexico, we're working with a number of groups where we are have developed an incentive program to uh, 
um, pay fishermen to slightly change how and where they fish, which then leads to avoided mortality of sea turtles, in this case bycatch sea turtles. And then we're commoditizing those that avoided mortality into bycatch credits. And then we set up a very similar broker model where we have raised, we've capitalized the fund with philanthropic dollars to pay for those financial incentives, to cover the opportunity costs of the fishermen, to change how they fish, and to be able to do the science to commoditize, if you will, that avoided mortality into bycatch credits. Then we hope to develop a framework where we could actually resell those bycatch credits either on a voluntary basis or potentially to U.S. fisheries that happen to be heavily regulated under the ESA for sea turtle bycatch. So there are a number of similar programs that are still very early in the pilot stage that have uh, a similar framework in the sense of trying to develop an incentive program to engage whether it's fishing co-ops, uh, local co-ops, uh, private landowners, et cetera, and then try to generate demand to create a financial sustainable uh, system that um, doesn't rely exclusively on philanthropic dollars over the long term. And then even if, if you look, um, so that's the international case, if you look outside species and habitat, we're doing a lot of work right now in conversations with USDA and EPA around a pre-TMDL water quality trading program and there's a number of utilities and other point sources that, you know, they know they're going to have increasing affluent issues moving forward, and they're happy to try to get ahead of the curve. It's all about that regulatory certainty, so the water quality piece. And then from a non-regulatory standpoint, we uh, are involved in a project called Aqueduct at WRI, which is a water risk program, and we're working with the Goldman Sachs, the Cokes, um, you know, those, those types of, of large Fortune 500 companies, uh, to understand what their water risk is, even absent of regulation, because it makes good business sense to understand, account for, and hopefully mitigate those risks. So we do think that this idea is taking hold, um, and, and more and more of these environmental regulatory uh, risk issues are being factored into the decision-making process and really becoming institutionalized. Uh, this is Jamie Mulligan. I work with Todd and Josh. Lauren's having trouble with her audio, so I'm going to pose the next question. Can you all hear me? Yes. Great. This is from Lisa Widoff. Apologies if I mispronounced the name. Is there a risk that a pre-listing conservation market, if there are investors backing the credit, would incentivize keeping the species at risk and not restored? How do you expect funding requirements to differ in terms of pre-listing versus post-listing restoration efforts? So to take the first part of that question, we, we've heard that several times, and I guess in theory that is a risk, um, but it's not something that we're, we're really that concerned about in the short run especially. Um, you know, if you look at the gopher tortoise, the amount of harm someone would have to go in and do to individually kind of change the trajectory would be, would be pretty large, and we like to think that people are generally good people and aren't going to uh, game the system. In the end, um, we think that we have enough safeguards in place with the monitoring and verification and mitigation ratios to account for some of those risks. And our, our whole uh, joke has been, if we ever get to the point where someone is gaining the system, the underlying silver, the silver lining there is that we've gotten to enough scale that that's a, that's a, that's a, a risk that we're happy to be trying to deal with. And Josh, I don't know if you have any thoughts on the second part about the pre-listing versus post-listing funding. Can, can you repeat the question, Jamie? Sure. The question is, is there a risk that a pre-listing conservation market, if there are investors backing the credits, would incentivize keeping the species at risk and not restored? How do you expect funding requirements to differ in terms of pre-listing versus post-listing restoration efforts? Sure. So, so on the latter part of the question, at least in theory, uh, one of the main advantages of thinking about a pre-listing framework is that it should be cheaper, in some cases quite a bit cheaper, um, to produce a net conservation benefit for a candidate species 
as opposed to an ESA listed species. That might not always be the case, but it probably will be the case in some some situations. And the other advantage is, at least theoretically, you're hopefully um, avoiding any um, issues with uh, legal legal battles, etc. Um, so in some sense. That's one of the main, main drivers of trying to think about a pre-listing conservation. In terms of reverse incentives, with any of these quote-unquote market-based um, strategies, you always have to have your eye out for reverse incentives and for ways um, that folks can game or cheat the system. We're dealing with that right now in Mexico with fishermen. Fishermen are, are particularly a creative bunch. and we have had to kind of adopt our strategy and heavily rely on technology um, and be very conservative on how we estimate those credits to ensure and mitigate for that risk of, of um, perverse incentives and making sure that um, you're reaching a net conservation benefit. But at the end of the day, I think these, these potential perverse incentives will become an issue only once uh, once and if um, a framework or a system goes to scale, in many cases, at least in the beginning, we're talking about not really a market, but bilateral contracts. So a, a bilateral contract between Todd and Fort Benning, for example, et cetera, as opposed to what some people think about this, you know, this actual functioning market where people are buying and selling credits um, at high volume. That's not going to be the case. And it's unlikely to be the case any time in the near future. So if we end up with, with issues around perverse, and system, perverse incentives if people gain the system, that would probably be a, a nice problem to have, as Todd mentioned. Okay, and uh, we're running out of time here, so we'll answer just one last question from Nikki Lamp. She says, have you or are you developing a method to determine how many credits a specific parcel of land is worth so they go for tortoise specifically? And would this method be easily transferable to other species? So I uh, sure. yeah. the answer is, is, is yes to both of those. Um, you know, I'm just going to swing back to, um, you know, we, as, as I think Josh mentioned, we're, it's a, it's a, a, a it's doing intense stakeholder engagement, understanding the ecological attributes most necessary for high quality habitat and population increases. And we've taken a hybrid approach of focusing on habitat quality as a proxy for populations, and then actually doing a line transect sampling method that's been uh, vetted by a bunch of experts to really get a feel for the presence and abundance of species on a particular partial. Um, it's something that we're going back and forth with with the state agencies and with the Fish and Wildlife Service and with the herpetologists and biologists to make sure we get it right. And what are we not accounting for? Where are those risks and how do we account for them in, in a mitigation ratio uh, system? So we feel really good about the way things are going, but we're not quite over the finish line yet. Uh, but it's based on best science, it's based on adaptive management. In terms of its applicability to other species and geographies, we think the framework um, of what we set up here is extremely um, applicable to other geographies. And in fact, we've worked with folks in the Chesapeake Bay on uh, a number of, of uh, the Marga fox squirrel issues using the exact same framework and sage grouse out in some of the western states. Clearly, the specific attributes that you're looking at are going to vary. The weighting of those attributes is going to vary depending on the drivers of impairment and the needs of the species, but really um, kind of the categories uh, should be relatively similar and the way that you verify, track, uh, register things over time, uh, we want to see as much consistency there as possible. And, and just to add to that, add to that quickly, uh, uh, in the gopher tortoise uh, scenario, We've tried to rely and adopt uh, third-party uh, standards. In the case of, of gopher tortoises, we're using <coughs> a standard that was developed and heavily tested um, by the Army Corps of Engineers um, yeah. and has been approved by the whole suite of, of um, gopher tortoise specialists, if you will, in the southeast. And in the applicability, uh, the details of the gopher tortoise 
creating a deadly system won't apply, obviously, to other species because their biology is going to be quite different. But the, the idea of a hybrid model that takes into account habitat and species, I think, uh, does apply and is very important. Lots of people are focused on species-centric crediting systems. Others are focused on habitat-centric uh, crediting systems. There's disadvantages and advantages to both of those. Um, and I think that a, probably a hybrid approach might be the best way forward. And, and just on that, so initially we focused on Georgia and Alabama, uh, and we intentionally did not pilot this in Florida because Florida State Wildlife Agency has their own mitigation program uh, because of the, at the state level it's listed as threatened in Florida, and we didn't want to confuse or compete with what they were trying to do, but we've remained in close coordination with the folks at the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and some of the nonprofits there. Um, we're now looking at how some of the findings that we've had can really leverage their program uh, and really build additional incentives on top of the uh, heavily translocation-based program that they've developed in Florida. So uh, we do think that there's a ton of applicability, a ton of leverage opportunities, uh, and, and really combine the best of both worlds with habitat and, and species-centric approaches. So hi, this is Lisa Widoff. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, right. great. Well, um, I'm going to step in for Lauren and um, close out our session today. I just want to thank you, Josh and Todd, for, uh, for providing the webinar and the information and, and giving us both the, con the larger context of these kinds of uh, market-based strategies and how your um, project ideas are fitting in, and I'm sure everyone is anxious to sort of hear more about how these pilot studies play out and uh, progress on the experiments in general. So um, look forward to, to you know, uh, keeping posted about it, and we are uh, appreciative of your time and everyone else's time for listening in. The last thing I'd say is if anyone has any further questions for Josh, you can email Lauren, and we'll kind of get that out to, to Josh and make sure you get an answer. So thanks, everyone, for your time and attention during the call, and for Josh and Todd and Lauren for organizing it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you to the Switzer Network for, for the confidence in us to, uh, you know, invest in us in, in making this a reality. So thank you. Thank you. Bye now.